family and friends, we welcome you to this memorial service for Michael Bartlett Elsie. Our, we'd like to thank Sister Leanne Smith Elsie, Mike's daughter-in-law, for, for providing our prelude and postlude music today. I am Bishop Alan Oates. I will be presiding today and conducting. I am the Bishop of the American Fort Hillcrest First Ward and grateful to the family for allowing me to participate. I'm just going to listen to yours. That musical number will be provided by Kevin Elsey, my son, his family from their home in Cedar Hills, Utah. And they'll be singing, I Need Thee Every Hour, after which Kevin Elsey will offer our opening prayer, again, from his home in Cedar Hills.
Our Heavenly Father, we are blessed to gather together as family and friends to honor the life and remember the life of, of Mike Elsie. We are grateful in the knowledge of the resurrection and in the knowledge of eternal families. We are grateful to have been part of his life and the receive the influence and guidance and love that we have all received from him. Father, we ask that thou would bless us with hope and understanding and thy spirit as we um, remember and honor him. And we say these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'd like to thank Kevin and his family. I um, also want to thank the Serenity Funeral Home for allowing us to provide this service to people all over the world today. Our uh, program will go as follows. We will first have a live sketch presented by Leanne Elsie Hyatt, Mike's daughter, after which the treasured story will be given to us by Sister Lydia Elsie Karchner, Mike's daughter. After which, Jim Elzey, Mike's son, will give us remarks from his home in Malaysia. After which, uh, we will hear remarks from Rob Elzey, uh, Mike's son. We'll proceed to that. Here. My name is Leanne Elsie Hyatt. I'm the oldest child of Mike and Jean Elsie. And we're here to honor Michael Bartlett Elsie, who was born on August 9th, 1939, to Robert Edgar Elsie and Laura Jane Bartlett. He was much loved by his parents and their only child. Dad was a beautiful child with blonde hair and blue eyes. He was usually quite obedient, but had a fun sense of humor. When he was very young, he blocked up the toilet by trying to flush his father's slipper. One year after finding his real Easter eggs, he hid one of himself under the couch cushions. His parents smelled something bad for days before they found it. Dad was young during World War II. During his prayers every night, he would recite, now I lay me down to sleep which reads, now I laid me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. But he would switch out the soul to keep words and replace it with his soldier keep. Since his father was a serviceman, his family moved many times. He would often call all the other soldiers daddy. He told me once that he went to six different elementary schools. His parents finally settled in Phoenix for at a young age, Dad learned to recognize the shapes of all the military airplanes used in the war. He could name any flying plane from below. He would tell others he wanted to be an aeronautical engineer when he grew up, but he didn't really know what it was. He began reading at a young age and never quit. Comic books were his first favorites, and then he moved on to history and mystery. Dad had a dog that was a big part of his life when he was young. Skippy was half coyote and half German shepherd. He would howl at the moon and scare the neighbors. Playing outside, keep the can, hide and seek were favorites. Many of his childhood friends are still close to him today. When dad was 10 and in grade school, he attended Monta Vista Elementary School, which at the time, Grandma Glenn was teaching first grade. I don't think that this was a coincidence. Dad was very devastated when at age 12, his parents divorced at Christmas time. He lived with his mother, who, Larry, who later married Otto Puckner. He often visited his father, who could only cook jello, and dad ate a lot of it. He began band in grade school, playing the trumpet, but found his true love on the French horn. He continued playing through high school and on through college. As an adult, he would march around the house, directing classical music. He often would drag us out to listen to French horn solos on the car radio. Both of dad's parents took him to the Methodist church each week. 
Many of his friends were a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. A ninth grade dad entered Phoenix Union High School. He had good math and college prep classes, which helped him in the future. He played tennis and was in the marching band. As a freshman, dad and Alan Wick were paired as lock partners. He played a significant role in dad's life. At age 16, dad met his lifetime sweetheart mom at Alan's home when they gathered to make posters for Alan to run for junior class president. Dad and mom dated steadily for a year. They went to movies and school dances. Dad only liked to slow dance. Even after breaking up, they went to senior prom together. Before prom, he teased mom that he was giving her blue carnations. But ended up bringing red roses. Part of the reason what's on his casket today. One time while hanging out at the Ormiston house, mom and dad were sitting on the couch when a grapefruit rolled by. Mom insisted that dad ignore it when an orange rolled by. Although mom was still asking him not to pay attention to it, dad found the culprit behind the couch. Uncle Jim told him he would leave them alone if dad would pay him a quarter. Dad paid up. High school football games were a big deal, and since dad played in the band, mom and her friends always sat close to them. After a year of dating, Grandfather Elsie asked Dad to break up with Mom, stating that they wouldn't make it to college if they stayed together. Dad, being obedient, broke up with Mom. During the summers, Dad worked at his father's insurance company. After high school, Dad was accepted to both Stanford and USC. He chose University of Southern California because he had a scholarship there. He was in a fraternity there called Kappa Kappa Psi. He tutored some of the other students in the fraternity. His sophomore year, he transferred to University of Arizona in Tucson. He was in reserve officer training for the Air Force and still in the band. Most of his friends were also in the band. He majored in chemical engineering with a minor in history and music. One year, Brigham Young University was playing University of Arizona in, in Tucson. Mom was attending BYU and wrote to Dad to tell him she was coming down and wanted to see him. Mom saw him marching by with the band and was yelling and pointing to her now empty ring finger. He smiled and said at that time he saw his posterity. They were engaged over Thanksgiving and he gave her a ring for Christmas. They set plans to be married August 22nd, 1960. During spring break of 1960, Dad was baptized in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. His first calling was as the priest corps president, which is actually a calling held by the bishop. So we teased him that he was the bishop for a week. Mom graduated in elementary education from BYU on a Friday, drove home on Saturday, had a rehearsal dinner on Sunday, and they were married on Monday. And that was pretty much the start of our crazy life. After a short honeymoon, they moved to Tucson and she began teaching school at Flowing Wells Elementary. She stopped after one year when she was pregnant with me. Dad and mom were sealed in the Mesa Temple in May of 1961. At the temple was the first time mom felt me move. I was born in Tucson in October of 1961. Dad graduated from the University of Arizona in January of 1962. They packed their VW bug and moved to Seattle to work for Boyd, where he would stay for 41 years. He loved his job and wished everyone loved their jobs as much as he did. He rode the bus or right pulled most of the time, which created long hours that gave him lots of time to read. They first lived in Burien, where Dad started his long scouting, long scouting career. As the scoutmaster, he found out that nothing stops campouts, even the rain. Since Dad never cooked, we're not sure what they ate at camp. In total, he spent 53 years in scouting. In October 1962, Linnea joined the family, and in June 1964, a year and a half later, Rob and surprise Jim came along. Four children in diapers under two and a half was crazy. The first couple of big purchases were a station wagon and a washer and dryer. About one year after the twins were born, they moved to Bellevue, Washington into a new home that was painted blue, Dad's favorite color. Dad was born, David was born in 1968 and Kevin in 1970. 
After much prayer, they added John in 1979 and Betsy in 1980. Dad attended all of our concerts, award ceremonies, sporting events, and other activities. He was always there. During 1980 and 81, Dad and Mom were called to serve in the Asian branch of the church. They grew to love the Asian people, and it had a great impact on their lives. After Dad retired in 2003, they moved to American Fork, where they currently live. They have always felt very blessed to have wonderful friends, neighbors, and church leaders wherever they have lived. Some of the things Dad was known for were playing with the neighborhood children, watching football, clipping the rockeries, skipping with his daughters, mowing the lawn with a push mower, breaking leaves, doing dishes and laundry, going to the library, being on time, and playing with babies at church. He had a loud whistle, and you could hear him two houses away when he would sneeze or blow his nose. He always had butter on lifesavers and a handkerchief in his pocket. He loved cherry pie, chocolate, sometimes together, liver and onions, plum pudding with hard sauce, and fruitcake. Yes, he's the only person I know that likes fruitcake. <laughs> the bakery workers at Safeway knew him by name. Some of his common sayings were, not now, I just had a bar of soap. Don't play with object, sharp, sharp objects, because this is what happened to me, and he would hold up his hand with one finger bent down. One of the best things our parents did was how inviting they were to our friends. Many of them were considered part of the family. Some of these were Leslie Sassenach, Angie Cox, Stevie Winecoop, John Thielen, David Richardson, Crystal Maxwell, Jaden Schofield, Bryce Weed, Sam Escabilia, the Lindens, and many, many others. As children, my siblings and I freely roamed the neighborhood. Dad's loud whistle had special tones that we would listen for, telling us it was time for dinner or bedtime. Most of the time, we would come running from all different directions. Now that he has passed, we know that he is in heaven watching over us. When it is my turn to leave this world, I will be listening for his special whistle to call me home. Oh, I wish I had gone first. I wouldn't have cried so much. Now she got me crying. <laughs> oh, okay. I actually have the fun and easy part of this. She, Leanne worked really hard on that for days, and I just have a sweet story to tell. This story is called Information, Please. When I was quite young, my father had one of the very first phones in the neighborhood. I remember well the polished old case fastened to the wall. The shiny receiver I hung on the side of the box. I was too little to reach the telephone, but used to listen with fascination as my mother would talk, would talk into it. Then I discovered that somewhere inside that wonderful device lived an amazing person. Her name was Information Please. And there was nothing she did not know. Information Please could supply anybody's number the correct time of day. My first personal experience with this genie in the box came one day while my mother was visiting the neighbors. Amusing myself at the tool bench at the basement, I whacked my finger with the hammer. The pain was terrible, but there didn't seem to be anyone, any reason to cry because there was no one in the house to listen to me. I walked around the house, sucking my throbbing finger, trying to finally arriving to the stairway, the telephone. Quickly, I ran to the footstool in the parlor and dangled and dragged it to the landing. Climbing up, I unhooked the receiver and held it to my ear. Information, please. I said into the phone piece just above my head, a click or two, and a small voice, clear voice spoke into my ear. Information, 
I hurt my finger, I wailed into the phone. The tears came readily enough now that I, I had an audience. Isn't your mother home, came the question. Nobody's home but me, I blubbered. Are you bleeding? No, I replied. I hit my finger with a hammer and it hurts. Can you open your ice box, she said. I said I could. Then chip off a little piece of ice and hold it to your finger, said the voice. After that, I called information, please. For everything, I asked her for help on my geography and she told me where the Philadelphia was. She helped me with my math. She told me my, my pet chipmunk that I caught in the park just the day before uh, would eat fruits and nuts. Then there was a time Petey, our pet canary, died. I called information police and told her the sad story. She listened, then said the usual things grown up say to soothe a child, but I was unconsoled. I asked her, why is it that birds should sing so beautifully and bring joy to all families only to end up in a heap of feathers on the bottom of the cage. She must have sensed my deep concern, for she said quietly, Paul, always remember that there are other worlds to sing in. Somehow I felt better. Another day I was on the telephone, information, please, information, said the um, now familiar voice, how do you spell fix? I asked all, I asked, all this took place in a small town in the Pacific Northwest when I was nine years old. We moved across the country to Boston. I miss my friend very much. Information please belonged to the old wooden box back home. And somehow, I somehow never thought of trying the tall, shiny new phone that sat on the table in the hall. As I grew into my teens, the memories of my childhood Conversations never really left me. Often, in moments of doubt and perplexity, I would recall the serene sense of serenity I had then. I appreciated now how patient, understanding, and kind she was to have spent her time on a little boy. A few years later, on my way west to college, my plane put down in Seattle. I had about half an hour or so before between planes. I spent 15 minutes or so on the phone with my sister who lived there now. Then without thinking, I went, I thinking what I was doing, I dialed my hometown operator and said, information please. Miraculously, I heard the small clear voice. I knew so well, information. I hadn't planned this, but I heard myself saying, could you fix, could you please tell me how to spell the word fix? There was a long pause. Then came the soft-spoken answer. I guess your finger must have healed by now, I laughed. So it really, really, it, it's really still you, I said. I wonder if you have any idea how much you meant to me during that time, I wonder. She said, if you knew how much your calls meant to me. I never had any children and I used to look forward to your calls, she said. I told her how often I thought of her over the years. And I asked if I could call her again when I came back to visit my sister. Please do, she said. Just ask for Sally. Three months later, I was back in Seattle. A different point I answered, information. I asked for Sally. Are you her friend? She said, yes, a very old friend, I answered. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, she said, but Sally has been working part-time in the last few years because she was sick. She died five weeks ago before I could hang up. She said, wait a minute, did you say your name was Paul? Yes, well, Sally left a message for you. She wrote it down in case you called. Let me read it to you. The note said, tell him I still say there are other worlds to, to sing in. He'll know what I mean. I thanked her and hung up. I knew what Sally meant. I'm grateful for this opportunity to have participated with my family, although it's been very, very different, difficult and surreal. I know we will miss our dad very much. I say this these images is Christ to them. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, 
I usually start a by saying, good morning, brothers and sisters. I'm so glad to be here to talk to you, but this is a little bit different experience. I'm not actually very glad to be speaking to you. These are one of those things you hope you never have to do. And in fact, today's a little bit unique because it's one of the first times that I'm talking to many of my brothers and sisters all at the same time, my literal brothers and sisters, and I love each one of them, and I want them to know how proud I am of them and appreciate their support and love for Corey and I, and wish that we could be there in the States to be with you, to, uh, to, to be there at this time, and we miss you dearly. And of course, I'd rather be speaking at church or anywhere else rather than speaking at a funeral. Over the past few months, as my father's condition has worsened, um, he has relied very heavily on the support of family and friends to help him particularly his spouses, uh, sorry, his children and their spouses. My brothers and, and my brothers-in-laws have helped to carry him from his bed to his couch um, and back, every e back to his bed every evening. My sisters and other sisters-in-laws have helped to clean and feed and provided comfort and they've sang songs and read stories. And Corey and I have missed out on this wonderful opportunity and the, the joys that it brings. And it's one of my only regrets um, with my father. My youngest sister, Betsy, who has specific training and experience as a care nurse, has taken on most of the difficult tasks for caring for our father. And both myself and all of our family will be eternally grateful for her compassionate and loving service and care. During one of the quiet moments that she spent alone with my father, she asked him if he was afraid of dying. I wonder how each of you might answer that question. I've wondered how I might answer that question. But he replied very simply and surprisingly, no, I'm not afraid at all. My dad didn't necessarily want to die. He just understood what was ahead and what it meant for him. His knowledge and faith in the plan of salvation uh, and in the gospel of Jesus Christ provided for him the basis of a fearless journey towards death. Essentially, it was this. He knew where he'd come from. He knew why he was on the earth and he knew where he was going after death. And understanding these principal questions I believe can have a greater impact on our earthly happiness and our eternal happiness than any other kind of knowledge that we might possess. If you think back on your life, we've all gotten lost at one time or another from the ones that we love. You might remember that feeling when you're three or four or five years old and you've gone to the state fair or maybe Disneyland or you're in a crowded shopping area and all of a sudden you turn around and realize that you're all alone. And that feeling of dread and panic and fear overcomes you. And I suspect that without knowing what will happen after death, this is the kind of feeling that many people might have. But my dad did not have to worry about those feelings. He knew that life on this earth was but a very short portion of our eternal existence. And that before coming to this earth, we had lived literally with our Heavenly Father as His spirit children. He's the Father of our spirits. And while we were there, we counseled with each other. We knew each other. We prepared to be able to come here to earth. In this pre-earth life, we didn't have a body. We could not feel the physical pains that my dad suffered towards the end of his life. <clears throat> We could not learn to control our physical appetites or desires, and essentially we could not progress um, without having the experience of having a body. And that's why we came to Earth. We came here to get a body, to learn to control our passions and desires, uh, to demonstrate to our Heavenly Father that we could follow His commandments, to learn to care for other people through meaningful service, you know, Corey and I live in Malaysia, and it's been very interesting to learn about some of the other religious beliefs that are here. Malaysia is a predominantly Muslim country. And so um, 
the people here also revere Abraham as their father, uh, their great father, one who gave them great blessings, and that through Abraham, all the people of the earth were blessed, much like we as Christians believe. Abraham, like many of the other prophets, had a wonderful vision in his life, and he was shown he was shown the stars, he was shown the throne of God, he was shown other worlds, he was... Um, he literally spoke to the Lord in his words. He said, face to face as one man speaketh to another. He was shown all the works that Christ had made. And he said they were multiplied before his eyes and he could not see the end of them. But the interesting thing I wanted to mention was Abraham was also shown all of the spirits that existed before they came to this earth. And he was told, Abraham, you are one of those spirits. You are one of those great and noble spirits. Well, I truly believe that Mike Elsey was also one of those uh, noble and great spirits. Um, and I want to tell you just a little bit of why I believe that. As Leanne mentioned, my dad was always devoted to serving others. Uh, he would very often forego his own pleasures in order to serve other people. He probably helped over a hundred people move out of or into their home. And of course, Rob and I and the other kids all know what that was like because we got towed along to help. He helped build our church building. Uh, in fact, he nearly died twice while doing that. He served, as Leanne mentioned, for 50 some years as a devoted scout and leader as a community activist, very interesting. Uh, he was a devoted father, a faithful husband, a compassionate and dedicated and loving and, and honorable man. He truly understood what many of us miss, and that is that happiness in this life comes through serving others and not through serving our own desires. He understood also that the purpose of this life was and he lived it to the fullest and the best of his abilities. And I think this is all that our loving Heavenly Father expects of us. As, as my dad has approached his death and now passed away, many of my children have approached me and asked about my feelings and my well-being after my father's death. And of course I'm sad, and of course I'm heartbroken for my mother who has lost someone that has been her companion for so long. And I'm upset that we can't be at home and be close to other family at this time, but I am not crushed or distraught over my father's passing. I wanna explain what I mean by that. I've come to understand that just like birth was a very short passage between this pre-earth life to coming to earth, so is the passage from, from this earth to returning to our Heavenly Father's presence. It's literally as simple as watching my dad stand up from the couch and walk into the other room. He isn't gone and he's in a much better place. He has a reunion with his beloved family, his father, his mother, his little Coley, and so many others. I have no regrets. And I don't think he did either. He often told me that he loved me. He often told me that he was proud of me. My heart is not broken and there isn't a hole in it because I believe he filled it by the way he lived his life and the things that he told me. My dad had many library cards. I know he had one from the Provo Library, the Linden Library, the American Fork Library, probably had one to the Salt Lake Library, two or three of them in Bellevue. My mother was impressed to make a note recently about my father. You know, for those of you who don't know, he could read many novels in a week's time. Le 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 Leanne would go to the library and get books for him and bring them home. He was a voracious reader. My mom was chuckled a couple of days ago and said, well, now, he has access to all of the libraries that have ever existed. And so I'd just like to say, may he read in peace. And that's my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
My name's Rob. I'm Mike's oldest son, twin to Jim, who you just heard from. Tending to my dad's uh, needs has created some truly ritualistic routines, sprinkled with a little bit of melodramatic moaning he likes to do. I one, he one time said to me recently, I'm not hurting when I moan, I just kind of like to moan. <laughs> uh, in those daily patterns, Betsy has conscientiously done things to lift dad's spirits and to engage his mind and heart and really has a gift for such things with dad. Uh, one of those daily routines is that Betsy's gotten dad to sing aloud before going to bed. A few months ago, as Betsy and I were in the middle of tending to dad's nighttime meds and other nighttime regimens, Betsy told me that she had tried to get dad to sing to the hospice nurse that morning. She told me that he wouldn't sing to the nurse. <clears throat> um, and then she told me that when she had asked him why, he patted her on the bum gently and said to her, because I love you. She giggled at her storytelling in that giggly way that she has since she was a little girl. And then Papa said from the bed nearby, did I say that? He chuckled at himself, also thinking it was a funny story that he truly hadn't even remembered. For Betsy, he would sing, You Are My Sunshine, which I think is truly fitting. Dad's not been one to, in my lifetime, be very verbally affectionate. Uh, frequently, I remember him formally bringing my twin brother Jim and me into the bedroom before we left for college to tell us his love for us, awkwardly and haltingly. But over the past few months, his expressions of love to Betsy and to me and to others have come much more freely. So before I make my remarks, I pay a well-deserved tribute to Betsy, to JC, to Mom, and to literally dozens of others in Bishop Oaks Ward and beyond for the way that they have affectionately and selflessly provided service um, to Dad and his needs as he's becoming increasingly dependent. One night I came into their bedroom and mom was there who'd also been in a little bit of pain that day and mom loves Broadway's and she was actually singing a line from a Broadway musical Old Man River but Old Man River he keeps rolling along you and me we sweat and strain body all aching and racked with pain and then she paused and she whispered to dad that's you and me Michael but we're still going along. <clears throat> As a side note, one of the other songs that Dad would loudly sing in the evening during his wind-down routine with Betsy is a cowboy western <laughs> that his dad had apparently sung to him around the house when he was a young boy, maybe of seven or eight. It's a 1946 Rex Tex Ritter song that goes like this. <laughs> there was blood on the saddle and blood all around and great big puddle of blood on the ground cowboy laying it all covered with gore and he never will ride any broncos no more <laughs> there apparently was uh, early learning about death and dying in his home just from the cowboy western songs mom had asked that i speak on the subjects of death and dying and the spirit world and what they play in our heavenly father's eternal plan for the destiny of his children so i'd like to speak briefly about uh, these six things one a deadly virus, two, a nighttime vision, three, a parable of Jesus, four, a clear pair of priorities, five, a letter from a father to a son, and finally, a beckoning call from dad, a virus. When I was 11 years old, two revelations were added to our canonized scripture, both adding to our understanding of the spirit world. One of them was at least in part motivated by questions that came during another worldwide virus pandemic. By 1918, the Spanish flu had spread across the globe and it was estimated that one third of the world's population was infected with a death toll of some 50 million across the globe. The president of the church at the time was Joseph F. Smith, son of the martyred patriarch Hiram Smith, a nephew of the martyred uh, prophet Joseph Smith. And in his personal life, the prophet, uh, President Smith, uh, during such dead, uh, this uh, deadly pandemic, was acquainted with the grief of the, uh, that come with death. Although not related to the pandemic, his own son, President Smith's son, Hiram Mack Smith, 
uh, passed away earlier in that year. This son, um, Hiram Max Smith, interestingly, was sustained as an apostle in the very same general conference that President Joseph F. was sustained as the president of the church, father and son, together in the apostleship. Many likely thought that this very young apostle would eventually leave the church, but that was not to be. When I was baptized in the restored church, along with Jim, in the summer of 1976, President Joseph Fielding Smith, another son of Joseph F. Smith, did leave the church as our president, but Hiram's death, at such a young age, stung President Smith. He was consumed with questions about death and dying and the spirit world. Just weeks prior to President Smith's own death, as he was riddled with these questions, a vision opened to him of the spirit world. Among other things, he learned in this vision, now canonized as section 138, that there appears to be some kind of separation, whether literal or figurative, between the righteous and the wicked in the spirit world. Jesus did not go among the wicked when he appeared in that state following his crucifixion and before his resurrection. Rather, Jesus enlisted faithful elders, like my dad, and faithful sisters, like my mom, to share with others the gospel in the spirit world. Joseph F. Smith wrote of these sisters, these good sisters who've been set apart and ordained to the work will be fully authorized and empowered to preach the gospel and minister to the women while the elders and prophets are preaching it to the men. I don't know if that's by direction or if that's just by the natural process of social interaction that takes place. People like my dad share the redeeming truths about faith, in our Savior Jesus Christ, about repentance through his atonement, about baptism by our own choice or by proxy and then by choice through the temple ordinances, by the gift of the Holy Ghost that blesses us both here and there, and by the sacred role that temple ordinances can play in the redeeming of the dead who choose to follow the Savior. Although the Book of Mormon warns us to not procrastinate the day of our repentance, we also learn there's revelation that some repentance can occur um, in the spirit world. So, an important lesson learned in this virus and the vision that came is that we keep learning and growing and even repenting as we continue to fulfill the next stage of our second estate in the spirit world. Number two, a nighttime vision. My dad would not typically be described as a visionary man. His religiosity was simple and mostly quiet. But however, I have felt to share at this time an important, vivid dream, or a vision, you might say, that my dad had. Just weeks prior to when my brother Jim and I came home from our missions in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, my dad called us in the mission field, which he never had done except for on Christmas, of course. At the time, both Jim and I were serving our mission presence in the mission offices as traveling assistants. And so when I arrived back at my desk after traveling for several days, a note was left on my desk in the hand of my mission president. It simply said, call home now. <clears throat> I began to worry. Had someone died? Was there a terminal illness? Was there an accident? When I called home and I spoke with my dad, at first he just kind of small talked. We're so excited to have you home soon home. And how are you feeling about your mission? And do you, do you have your flight plans? And finally I said to my dad, Dad, why have you called? And then, almost sheepishly, he told me of a vivid dream that he had dreamt. <clears throat> when my dad told me of the dream, the spirit drenched my whole soul. I had a deep feeling that what my dad was sharing with me was very significant. In the dream, dad said that he had felt that he was in the mission field, something that as a convert in his young adult years, of course, hadn't taken place in his own life. But there he was on a mission, and he sensed that there was some urgency. He was trying to find someone. He was going door to door in this dream, missionary style. And then as he looked around to get his bearings, he was drawn to a street sign. There displayed prominently the name LZ Way. My dad said to me, I don't know what the dream means. But I think that you and Jim are supposed to find somebody named Elsie there in your missions. There's more Elsies in the eastern states than there are in the western states. 
over the next few weeks before coming home. I called every Elsie I could in a phone book. I even called a, a bar that was named Elsie's Place. Can you imagine that conversation? <laughs> but Jim and I came home perplexed, not knowing what the meaning of the dream was. And then a few weeks after we had both returned, the meaning became clear. A phone call came in the evening. I picked up the phone in the hallway there of our Bellevue home, and then Dad picked up the phone in the kitchen about the same time. The woman on the phone explained to me, with Dad listening, that she was calling to speak with a Mr. James Allen Elsey. Apparently, he'd stumbled, this woman had stumbled on one of Jim's printed articles of faith cards that he'd fastened to a tack board in an old Elsey homestead mansion that he'd visited. She explained that she was an avid genealogist. That's something that never happens. I thought of Dad this morning. He always had, he had a hanky in his pocket even here today. <clears throat> this genealogist hoped to collaborate on sharing information she was researching the Elsie family line. Elsie Way. The nighttime vision dream of my dad. Was it about other Elsies? Who Jim and I were supposed to find tracking in the streets of Pennsylvania. It was about our Elsies. About members of our family on both sides of the veil that needed the full blessings of the restored gospel. I have a deep and abiding testimony that the work of salvation and all that we do in the name of Jesus Christ to forward his purposes is first and foremost a family matter. I'm convinced that all that happens in the name of Jesus Christ in this world and all that happens in the spirit world is most centrally a family-focused work. Elsie Way. That's apparently what my visionary man father was having revealed to him and to us. Keep seeking to bless family members' lives with the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Third, a parable. One of the lesser-known parables of Jesus found in Luke chapter 16 might be named the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Most of the parable occurs in the storyline in the spirit world. Lazarus, not the brother of Mary and Martha, but someone else, was a street beggar who couldn't walk, was hungry, had a bad skin disease, possibly leprosy, was laid at the front gate every day of an unnamed rich man to beg. The rich man, by contrast, lived sumptuously with rich foods and rich clothes. And in the parable, both men end up dying at the same apparent time. Poor Lazarus ends up in the blessed state, embraced by the patriarch prophets like Father Abraham. However, the rich man ends up facing torment in flames and is separated from Lazarus and from the prophets. The rich man appeals to the prophet Abraham, saying, Send righteous Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Clearly, Jesus is teaching us several important things about the spirit world. One, there is some kind of separation between the righteous and the wicked in the spirit world. The wicked face some kind of torment for which they would hope to be spared. Third, we care about our families that are still in this world, and we hope to have them receive the gospel at this time. Yes, gospel teaching in this world and the spirit world is a family-focused thing. Four, priorities. One of the things which I'm deeply grateful for is the clear priorities that my mom and dad had on two things. The gospel of Jesus Christ and family. Each of his children had cherished memories of our parents' constant effort to be there. Ball games and stage productions and band and choir concerts and youth events and Christmas and birthdays that were a celebration. Gathering around the blue couch to pray, even when friends were around was a common pattern. My memory is a big swing at the Ensign Ranch that Dad pushed me on, a trout farm that he brought Jim and I to when we were very young with red bags in hand to be able to bring the trouts home, a big finger reaching back for scampering kids, one hand with one hand out, the other hand holding a wax pen at Prairie Market Supermarket, all to bring along the kids, probably to get them out of the hair of our, our mom. Everything my parents did celebrated us. When my mom and dad enlisted us, Jim and I, in a program by the YMCA called Indian Guides, think Cub Scouts with an American, Native American twist, 
we each had to come up with Indian names. This is a little bit the personality of my dad. I think Jim was Black Hawk and I was Brown Hawk or the other way around. And then dad, he chose to be Chicken Hawk. My mom and dad's priorities of Christ and family are reflected in the dying words of another father, Father Lehi, who said to his children and grandchildren just shortly before his death, Awake and arise from the dust and hear the words of a trembling parent whose limbs ye must lay soon down in the cold and silent grave from whence no traveler can return. A few more days and I go the way of all the earth. But behold, the Lord hath redeemed my soul from hell. I have beheld his glory and I am encircled about eternally in the arms of his love. And I desire that ye should remember to observe the statutes and the judgments of the Lord. Behold, this has been the anxiety of my soul from the beginning. That's when I'm dead. A letter. Nearly 15 years ago, my parents and some of the siblings and their spouses performed sealings in the Salt Lake Temple for some of our ancestors. The sealer was named Stephen Featherstone. After per performing some of the vicarious ordinances, he paused and he commended my mom and dad for being worthy to be there and for being the kind of parents that prepared these children who had gathered at that time to come and to worship in that sacred way. Being touched by the clear love that my parents had for each of us and for the Lord, he proceeded to tell us of an experience that he had had in his family related to the death and eternity. He told about one of his adult sons that had contracted a terminal illness, a young father with young children. One of the sons, uh, once the son was diagnosed, with his terminal illness, Brother Featherstone was asked by his son to give him a father's blessing. Brother Featherstone told us how much he ached to pronounce his son whole and to promise him that he would live. And so he felt he had the faith to do so. But he said that every time he laid his hands on the head of his son, the Spirit of God never would allow him to say such words. And in the end, in his last moments of life, in an ICU of the hospital, the son once again asked the father for a father's blessing. Brother Featherstone asked us who were gathered there in that ceiling room, and what were you, what would you, if you were the father, feel inspired to say in such a blessing? He told us that a passage from the closing chapters of the Book of Mormon had come to his mind with words from a cherished letter from the fallen Mormon to his now wandering and lonely son, Moroni. What were the words that Mormon said to Moroni in his treasured letter? Well, first, Mormon said regarding those of the wicked fallen nation of the family of Lehi, Behold, my son, I cannot recommend them unto God, lest he should smite me. But then, Mormon shared the following words, and these are the words that Brother Featherstone felt impressed to pronounce upon his son in that final father's blessing in the ICU. But behold, my son, I recommend thee unto God, and I trust in Christ that thou wilt be saved. A few days ago, I was asked to pronounce a final blessing, this time from a son to a father, as he faced imminent death. And what were the words that I felt impressed to pronounce upon my dad's head? But behold, my father, I recommend thee unto God, and I trust in Christ that thou wilt be saved. A final thought. In a rare moment, I saw my dad tear up from the pulpit when he read that story that Lania had read to us. He wasn't one to get up and to pontificate from the pulpit. He was a gospel liver. <clears throat> but on that time, as he read that talk, and I remember his tweed jacket, and he folded his glasses up and stuck them in his po pocket and folded up the printed copy of the talk and folded it in his pocket, he tearfully testified simply, and I too know that there are other worlds to see. Those of you viewing this from a distance may not have recognized that on the inlay of the casket, on the silk on the inside, there's a phrase that had been inscribed, going home. I love that poem put to music. Going home, going home, I am going home. So my closing thought, a beckoning call from dad one of the less than flattering but very familiar patterns with dad is that he's been very anxious about time. He's probably worried that the hour's up of our funeral here. He's probably thinking it's time to be done. So a closing thought. 
In times of anxiousness, he often can be heard hollering with an impatient edge. Gene, that beckoning can always be heard with at least one exclamation point after it. And if he's called it repeatedly, there usually were multiple exclamation points. But today, from the other side of the veil, in this sparrow world, I'm absolutely certain that that beckoning call has a less edgy question mark. Gene? Gene? Mom and dad have been married for over 60, nearly 60 years. They started dating nearly 65 years ago. And dad's security in so many ways has always been mom. Someday when God's timing is right and the will of it of God comes, mom will come to dad's beckoning call from heaven. But I'm certain that a simple period will punctuate his beckoning call. Gene. David mentioned in a recent video conference that we had as a family on a family home evening that one of the trademark patterns of our adult childhood was that we were given liberty to run and to explore from the adventures across 24th Street to the blackberries across behind the Benzoin's home to being able to free, uh, freely run and, and roam. And then as Liat mentioned around dinner time, that uh, whistle would come as he'd stand on the porch and pucker the one side of his mouth, I don't know how he does it, but he'd whistle out of that one side of his mouth, that, pistol, uh, that piercing whistle that you heard Leanne uh, share. And so maybe there will come a time when he will call for each of us to come to our heaven. Robbie, Jim, Leanne, Livia, David, Kevin, Betsy, John, it's time. And when we arrive, I'm sure he'll be easy to spot. I'm sure all the others will be dressed in white and he'll still be clad in plaid. <laughs> I'm certain I'll do the same for my sweet children. Leanne, I love one of them. Josh, Jess, Bree, Caleb, Aaron. It's time to come home. Now, in the end, LZ Way isn't all about the LZ family. The Savior of the world will remind us all in the Bible, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. His beckoning call extended with all the love and the compassion that heaven can muster is, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I bear witness of he who is the source of all rest, who beckons from heaven to the call to each of us to come home, even Jesus Christ, amen. <laughs> I'd like to thank all of those who participated in the program today, all the way from Malaysia. What a time we live in if we can do this. We're grateful again for the Serenity Funeral Home for their help and putting things together to allow this broadcast. I first met Mike many years ago as I was assigned to be his ministering companion. We did so work together and served together for many years. And I learned a few things from him. I'll just share a couple of them here today. Number one was his love and admiration for Jesus. He was so proud of you. He was, I remember him talking about early in his career And he had to travel sometimes for several weeks at a time. And he left behind Gene 
and four children, and at that time the oldest was four. And uh, he said Jean handled everything that came to her and handled it very well. Was also impressed by the love and admiration that he had for his children and grandchildren. I was always impressed by the love of scouting and church service. I remember when our boys were coming into the Cub Scouts and Mike was committee chairman at that time. And uh, I started to complain that I had to build two Pinewood Derby cars. He listened and then smiled and he said, I had to build 15. So I never complained ever again after that. I was very impressed by the love of his career. He really developed the testing program for Boeing and devoted much of his life to them and traveled all over the world testing airplanes and models that he told me, some of which cost as much as a million dollars. And uh, every once in a while I had to break the news that this airplane is not going to fly. I'm sorry. So the next time you're on a safe trip on a Boeing airplane, you can think like this. I know from experience that death can be difficult. I lost my father and my sister recently. But I take comfort in the words in Ammon, chapter 22 of Alma. We learned that our Savior breaketh the bands of death, that the grave shall have no victory, and that the sting of death should be swallowed up in the hopes of glory. Well done, Mike. You have been a good and faithful servant. Enter now into the joy of thy Lord. And thank you, Mike. for being my friend. Say this humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay. Brothers and sisters, at the, after our closing prayer, we will then travel to the American Ford Cemetery uh, where we will be joined by family and friends. We encourage you to practice social distancing. I'm sure Jean would love to hug each and every one of you, but unfortunately at this time that is not to, to be. And so there will be some seats um, provided there so that after the dedication of the grave, people can come and, and fab by each family and sit in front of her and visit with her for a few moments and then allow the next family to come. Our closing prayer, or our closing hymn rather, is As I Have Loved You, hymn number 308, after which the closing prayer will be given by Roger Kirchner, a son-in-law.
Dear Father in heaven, in the sacred name of Jesus Christ, we end this a beautiful devotional for Mike Martin and Elsie, who we love very much. We are grateful for his example. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we may continue on in faithfulness, true and faithful to our covenants, that we may not lose any of us. We pray that the bell will be very thin right now. To be ministered by loved ones. We're grateful for Mom Elsie. We pray that she'll be clasped in the arms of Jesus to fill thy love. Help us to be buoyed up and blessed and ministered to by the Holy Ghost. We are grateful, Heavenly Father, for the Savior. Praise be thy name for the blessed gift of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer, who made it all possible for us to come back home as families. We love him and we love you with all of our hearts. We pray for that spirit to attend us all that we do this day in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.